Hi everybody, Jacob here. Welcome back to the Fragrant Bunker. Tis the time. Finally, here we go. Comet Chanel, the Eau de Parfum newly released fragrance in 2024, uh, the full-blown review. Now I have made already my video on my first reactions of this fragrance. You know, uh, we did the unboxing together. Um, we sniffed it together. You can go check out that video. It's a very interesting video because it, it, it's kind of like that visceral reaction that you have to a perfume. And it's a deep reaction. Many people have said that to them, this perfume smells simple, basic. I could not disagree more. Uh, this is the dent I made in the bottle. You can see how much juice, uh, and I know some people don't like to call it juice. Oh, well, disrespectful to the perfumer. <laughs> I'll be the judge of that. Uh, but uh, there's the dent. Quite a bit of it has been used up. I did spray it on earlier, so I do have the dry down actually here and here as well, but let's just spritz on some more of it to get the opening. While we're doing this, full-blown review coming now. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Push the join button next to the subscription button. Become a member today. Gain access to extra perks. You can also join me on Patreon. Super Dacob all spelled together there as well for extra perks. Thank you to my members and patrons who have already pledged. This video is being filmed live in front of a live virtual audience. I live stream several times a week on my main channel, Come join me there and partake in the fun. Mm. Everything I say in this video is for entertainment purposes only, not rooted in truths or facts. Everything's alleged and just my opinion. And boy, do I have an opinion. Thumb up the video. So, it is not a coincidence that I have decided to review this fragrance on Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. If you're watching this video after Mother's Day has passed, don't you fret none. Mother energy is strong in the fragrant bunker. Mothers are amazing and should be celebrated every day. And they are celebrated every day, at least in my world. So consider this a mother energy review. I prompted my uh, Bubbles the Bot AI to generate this gorgeous landscape with ancient Greek deities and some not so much deities. We're gonna get to it. And then we have the comets flying in the sky. We got a city in the background. We have these ancient antiquities and ruins and some cypresses and plants. Now, I have prompted Bubbles to generate certain characters. So do not think for a second that these sculptures actually really exist in real life and that they are portraying correctly certain deities and nymphs. This is just a vision of what they could look like or could have looked like. They're not historically accurate. But then again, memory is never historically accurate. Memory is emotion. Perfumes are emotion. So the story that a perfume gives you takes you to places that are only bound by your imagination. And as far as your imagination can, ta can, ta can take you is as far as you will actually end up going. So are we rooted in reality? No. But we are rooted in sensations and emotions. When I first sniffed Comet, and I know we should be calling it Comet, I just really cannot pronounce it that way because I don't like how harsh and aggressive it sounds. So I will be pronouncing it my way, which is not the correct French way. So I'm going to pronounce it in the softer way, which is comet, instead of comet. Hmm? Now, the first impressions I had were of almonds, the bitter almond. And it was a uh, an aggressive smell, uh, annoying, actually, cloying in a way. Uh, and it was kind of like my, my biggest fear for, you know, Comet, oh, the cherry blossom accord in the opening is going to be a problem because it's going to give me that shampooy, um, almondy accord. It turns out that the almond isn't really a bitter almond. It's a futuristic form of aldehyde really, uh, that Olivier Polch, who is the creator of Comet, uh, went down. So, you know, 
we're going to experience the future of Chanel here. But at the same time, this comet is going to take us places. We're going to jump on, jump on top of the, uh, this star or comet, and it's going to take us in different places. And the places it takes us to all lead up to one spot in time. And let's see if we make it to the end of that journey together. Now, why do I say the future of Chanel perfumes? Olivier started something very specific with his first fragrance for Chanel back in 2014-15, which was Misia, back in the day, Eau de Toilette, still made under the guidance of his father, Jacques, because Jacques was still there. Olivier was just taking over Chanel perfumes, and his claim to fame was Misia was his first fragrance, but I do believe that, uh, for Chanel, but I do believe that his father had his paws on it as well. And um, it definitely marked a turning point for Chanel. Interesting that his first perfume would be Misia because Misia was Chanel's frenemy. You know, she was her best friend, but they were also kind of, there was a competition going on there as well, you know. Misia loved gossip, loved to stir the pot, and Coco did as well in her own way. So it is also interesting that Olivier chooses that particular, well, brand marketing chose it for him, probably. The poor man probably had no <laughs> voice whatsoever because Chanel's brand marketing is vicious, allegedly. They do not let you do what you want to, you know. Which is one of the reasons why the... Uh, makeup uh, director for Chanel Beauty left uh, Mr. What's his name? Peter Phillips uh, left, allegedly also rumors have it, right in 2010 because he wanted to take control of, he wanted to control the ad campaigns for his makeup. And they said, no, no, you're not going to, you, you you get to create your little colors, your little colorlets, uh, but uh, marketing, leave it to us. So he said, okay, bye. So he went to Dior. Interesting, right? So I think Olivier has a little bit of uh, issues uh, there as well when it comes to um, control or letting go of control. And I think he needs to let go of control. So I do believe that Misia was given to him as a topic, like here, make a perfume on Misia. But it's interesting, and I do believe everything is holistic in this world because everything comes together, you know, a, a shift and a turning point for Chanel fragrances, definitely, because he took directorship of their perfumes, and then also the, the smell aspect of it. A lot more synthetical, synthetic ingredients were, were manufactured since then. And one of the biggest to, to have seen the light of day under Olivier's guidance is 1957, with a ton of synthetic musks that definitely symbolize a very futuristic approach to, to Chanel perfumes. And I talk about 1957 because the musks in 1957 are many. A few of them, to my nose, exactly the same, are also in the base of Comet. So, in fact, as we dig towards the dry down of Comet, we do get into that musky territory, which is very, very, very reminiscent to the point of being identical to 1957. If you close your eyes and you catch a waft of it, you have a vibe. You have a 1957 vibe there as well. But it's just one of the places that this comet is taking us to. It doesn't stay in the world of 1957 futurism, Chanel perfume futurism for a long time. It leaves and it goes elsewhere. And it does take us also to wonderful pastures and green fields during the lifetime of Coco Chanel surrounding her villa, La Pausa, and Bel Respiro. Particularly Bel Respiro because Bel Respiro has that grassy root, like fresh cut grass accord going for it, sometimes slightly pissy, especially the Eau de Toilette concentration, which is no longer in production, but the current version of the Eau de Parfum is quite well formulated. Um, there's a vibe, a rawness, a hint of Bel Respiro in Comet. You're not going to smell Bel Respiro in Comet, but you will sniff out an abstraction of a field freshly cut and that kind of grass smelling of that green note. What you're going to smell in here is an abstraction of green, but you will smell the rawness.
And as that rawness subsides, you get Cristal, and Cristal kind of just tickles you a little bit. There's there's um, almost a Sheepra quality to it, you know? Uh, and uh, there, you could say there's nothing Sheepra about this, but hiding in there is a creamier version of Cristal or the Toilette. And it's softened by the iris, which there's a ton of in here. So we do have the Cherry Blossom Accord, which is that aldehydic almondy vibe going on at the beginning, uh, you know, together with the aldehydes. And then you get in the center, we got the iris and another flower. And in the base, we have the musks. That other flower is what creates the magic in Comet. That other flower is what you see here in the background, in the sky, in this blue, slightly purpley sky. Yes, the iris is purple, but what is really important here, and this is the key, this is your ticket to go on the journey with Comet, your ticket to board this fragrance, your ticket to, to drive with Comet and to go on a journey through places, through time, past and future, that ticket is the heliotrope. And boy, oh boy, once it hits you, you realize what Comet is all about. The heliotrope has a slightly sweet honeyed accord, almost vanilla in its sweet vanilla, even though technically they do not claim that there's any vanilla in here. It's the heliotrope that gives us the illusion of vanilla. The sweetness is toned down by the iris. The iris has a powdery, dry accord to its nature. So you get that makeup y, powdery vibe going on that's toning down what could be perceived as too sweet of a heliotrope. So it never goes too sweet. It never goes shampooy, you know, how cherry blossom can be shampooy. It always stays very, very subdued in a very Chanel elegant manner. You know, it it sustains itself, okay? It never goes overboard in any direction. It is highly elegant and sophisticated. But the heliotrope is what kept me coming back to this and sniffing and re-sniffing and trying to understand more because there's a mystery in this perfume and I was trying to figure out what is it that it's trying to tell me all this time? You know, at a certain point in the dry down, once that impression and delusion of almonds, of bitter almonds, is, really blends and melts together with the vanillic aspect of the heliotrope, you all of a sudden envision Hypnotic Poison by Dior, the original Eau de Toilette from the 90s. That bitter almond accord and overdose of vanilla is what you kind of feel like a memory in a Comet. So there is that bold character that um, Dior fragrances had in the 90s, kind of really re-represented in this fragrance as well. So there's, it's a beautiful homage to the last really big era for perfume releases, which were the 90s. You know, from the 2000s, it all became flankers and less new releases and more, more of niche and less of, less dreams, really. Now we have to really use our imagination to dream because the bottles are not helping <laughs> and the launches are not helping either. 50,000 flankers of the same perfume over and over again. It's really tough. The perfume world, there have never been more new perfumes released every year than now. And yet, at the same time, the perfume world has never been blander. And that's sad. Just like with internet, we have all of this information at the tips of our fingertips, and yet we have never been so stupid like we are now. Knowledge is a sneaky thing, isn't it? The heliotrope also takes you on a journey towards Chanel number no. five, you realize in the dry down of this fragrance, latest cometh the dry down, you realize that this perfume is another facet of this fragrance, 
the queen of all Chanel perfumes, Chanel number no. 5 Extrait. I do have it in the 7.5 ml spray. I have a couple of drops left, and then I have to refresh it, get a new one to die for. And in fact, at a certain point in this review, we will layer them. And just like that, you realize every Chanel perfume is built around the essence, the core, the crystal, the dark crystal of Jim Henson, the dark crystal of Chanel is Chanel number no. five. And every other perfume can be layered with the extrait of Chanel number no. five. You can also work with layering the eau de toilette and the eau de parfum of Chanel number no. five. Low and au premier, a little bit less so, but still you could with all the other fragrances from Chanel. But you really realize the extrait of Chanel number no. five is the protrusion and the missing link to fulfill and complete every perfume that Chanel has released throughout all the decades. So once you layer number five with Comet, the journey is finally over. You're at peace. But how do we find this peace? How do we find this peace? Well, like every good story, there's a journey. And this journey begins with Ovid. Now, we're going to go back in time. We're going to go so, so far back in time, ancient Greece, and we're going to talk about a water nymph by the name Clyte, or Clitia, or Clitia. It all depends really from which century you are. The pronunciation of the name varies. Clyte was a water nymph. Her father I think had either 300 or 3,000 daughters. Water nymphs were magical, and they were all over the place back in ancient Greece. This is Clytie. Clytie fell in love, very much so, with a handsome god, except he was god, but also not god. It all depends, again, on which philosophy or which belief or which century we're kind of docking on to. She fell in love with Helios. Helios, also meaning the sun god, the god of the sun, he would wake up in the morning and with his chariot of, of horses that would spit fire, would ride across the skies like the sun and, and humanity would get sun, and then he would kind of ride his, with his horses and his chariot to the other side of the earth, and then it would be nighttime again. He had sisters and brothers, and one sister is dawn, the other sister is the moon. I mean, it's all very, very mixed up because according to different stories, these characters change. Their names change as well. In fact, in our story, the god that Clytie fell in love with is Helios. But in other beliefs, and here I can touch base on uh, the information that I've collected throughout my months of research, um, he does change name according to which stories we're listening to. So Helios was the son of Hyperion and Theia. Hyperion represented wisdom, light, and watchfulness. And his other children include the moon, or Selene, and the dawn, Eos. Helios' mother, Theia, was the goddess of light, daughter of the gods of the heavens and the earth. Now, it is interesting to note that ancient Greece is one of the pillars of Western civilization, right? And so the only way to understand many great works of art is to learn about ancient Greek religion and mythology. So the Greeks had a fascinating and complex polytheistic religion system in which countless gods and goddesses represented various aspects of the natural world and human life. Um, and also through time, the story would change. So the Greeks did not collect and unify their beliefs in a single book or church. So there are many competing accounts of Helios that existed side by side in ancient times. For example, Helios was just a minor god to most Greeks, but he was the chief god on the island of Rhodes 
In later times, Helios became more important, particularly in Rome. According to one tradition, Helios was a titan. The titans are the oldest gods in the Greek pantheon, said to be giants. They created human beings and many aspects of the universe. Titans thus often personified elemental forces such as the sun, time, and light. Helios was... Um, so, now, it, it's a little bit difficult because who do we want to believe Helios to be? <laughs> because he's also called Apollo in other belief systems within Greek mythology. So Helios and Apollo were two entirely distinct deities. Apollo represented purity and was not linked to the sun. However, starting in the 500s before Christ, a connection was made between Apollo and the sun. Towards the end of ancient times, many Greeks and Romans said that Apollo and Helios were two aspects of the same god. In ancient Greek art, Helios is portrayed as a handsome and strong man in a four-horse chariot. Beams of light often shoot out from the chariot to evoke the sun. Helios was the personification of the sun in ancient Greek religion, though he started out as a titan and the brother of the dawn and the moon. He was later associated with Apollo and Olympian, who represented purity. However, he typically played a minor role in the Greek pantheon. Helios was always portrayed as a handsome and strong young man, often with his four-horse chariot. But he's going to be Helios in our story. Nobody remembers Clytie, the water nymph, who fell madly in love with, with Helios. Of course, there was a problem with every good Greek tragedy and drama there are many implications and complications. Love is not requited. Love is often painful. Love is often connected to major sacrifice. The sacrifice does not always pay out. In other words, sometimes when you sacrifice yourself for love, you do not get a happy story, a happy ending. So what happens to Clytie? and Helios. She's on earth. She's a water nymph. He's in the sky. She looks at him as he drives his chariot so handsome and virile and strong. And he is a flirter. Uh, according to the mythology, Helios does check out the lovely ladies that are on earth. He does have affairs. He does dedicate his attention to the ones he thinks are the most beautiful and most deserving of his love, his caresses, his glance, his stares. In other words, he hypnotizes them. In other words, this is the old school Greek, ancient Greek version of a thirst trap, typical to modern day society on social media, where if you want to post pictures of yourself, trained body on Instagram, just giving away a little bit of something, but not everything. Keep, keep the thirsty people coming back for more. Well, Helios was basically the first, one of the first in ancient history, thirst trap creators, if you may. Many, many ladies and gentlemen would look at him in the sky and desire him and crave him. Clytie was nonetheless, but what makes her different? Well, the difference is he did allegedly look at her and she did fall madly in love. But Aphrodite steps in. Now, there's a different Aphrodite, the goddess of love. She is a jealous and spiteful goddess. You see, she has her version of love for people, and she wants attention as well. There are several accounts on what Aphrodite really did here. But one of the accounts that is most interesting to me is that she actually made him, made uh, Helios, look at another lady and made him fall in love with her. Now, mind you, this happened after Helios was giving attention to Clytie. Clytie was on her way in her mind, in her beautiful, innocent, nymph mind. She thought that Helios would become her husband. 
would become her lover forever, that they would make beautiful god creatures combined with nymph, water nymph creature babies. But Aphrodite wanted none of that. For whatever reason, she made him fall in love with another. To the unfortunate reaction of Clytie, because Clytie became so jealous that she found out who the father is of the young lady Helios fell in love with. And she went to him. He was a warrior king, a very proud man, dignified, conservative man. Clytie told the story of his daughter having an affair with the sun god without his permission, without his benevolence. The father thought that his pride was hurt. The family honor was damaged forever. The wrath of this king was so strong that he hunted his daughter down and buried her alive. He did not want to have anything to do with the damage of the image of his family, of his kingdom. The king buries his daughter alive. Clytie, not so innocent anymore, and here we can also connect to the loss of youth, realizes what she has done. But of course, Aphrodite is already a step ahead and lets Helios know what Clytie did. You can only imagine the wrath of Helios once he finds out what Clytie did, the betrayal. He could have been her lover from time to time. He would have definitely had other women in the future. Clytie was destined to not be the only one for Helios. So what happens? Clytie thinks that once her competition is gone, Helios would requite her love again, would pay her attention again, would look at her in the morning and during the day as he drives his chariot with horses that are spitting fire across the sky, would look at her, would pay her attention, would love her back as much as she loves him. But instead, having found out what happened from Aphrodite, although not the full story, he starts hating Clytie. Clytie for him becomes the symbol of ruthlessness, of, of, of being an entity that would do anything for its own ego. Of course, Helios also has a huge ego. He's a handsome god. Everybody looks up to him. How dare she think that she's above me, the god? How dare she think that she can just annihilate and delete another person that I've showed interest into or towards? And so, Helios does not respond to Clytie, does not respond to her cries for attention, the love that she keeps screaming at him every day as she sees him pop up in the sky. She's calling for him, begging him to look at her. Not one single glance or stare does he pay Clytie. The sacrifice that she made, thinking and believing that with that sacrifice she would get his love back, fails. The desperation and the pain in her heart, in her broken nymph heart, is so powerful and strong that she stops eating, she stops sleeping, she stops spending time in the water. She climbs up on top of the highest cliff she can find to, to try to reach him, to try to be as near as possible to him. And from the top of that cliff, day on and day out, as he would pop up in the morning and fly across the sky, she would follow him. 
cry for him every day. Not eating, not drinking, drying up, withering away. Every day, begging, hoping that he would give her one glance. But he never did. He never looked at her again. Other gods in the pantheon saw what was going on. They felt sorry for this water nymph. They wanted to ease her pain and her sorrow. For a nymph to die required a lot of work and sacrifice. It wasn't that simple. The sorrow, the vision of this creature slowly withering away and yet still living in the hope that she would get this unrequited love warmed the hearts of a few gods who decided to bestow upon her a gift. They could not stop her sorrow and they did not like the vision of a person suffering so, or of a nymph suffering so much on a mountain that they see every day. So also to make it easier on themselves and to ease her pain, they decided to turn her into a heliotrope flower. The heliotrope flower is famous for always turning its beautiful little tiny purple flowers towards the sun. It grows on these cliff type of landscapes and as the sun comes out, the heliotrope opens up and then follows the sun until the sun sets. Clyte is a heliotrope flower. The heliotrope being the heart of Comet. Now you see, even though Chanel wanted to name the perfume allegedly La Lune, uh, the moon, years ago when they, when they were planning to, to launch Comet, they decided to change the name. I don't believe that brand marketing at Chanel has any poetry in their heart. Personally, I don't think that they go so deep as my reviews do. I personally do not believe that they had any vision for this perfume other than connecting the name to the launch of their makeup chicks that work together, the, the Star Collection, Comet Collection, whatever they're called, Comet Collective, uh, relaunching the Comet uh, Jewelry from the 30s as well. So for, you know, for Chanel, I do believe this was just a strategic move to make their story very clear as a brand marketing, you know. But I see the poetry and I do believe in the holistic aspect of things. The fact that this is called a comet and it's a shooting star in a way through the sky, it is like a memory of Helios. Except he flies now during the nighttime because we can see the comet at night, not during the day, really, when the actual sun covers up the sky and we don't get a chance to see the comets flying during the daytime. So this is what this perfume is about. Unrequited love. You spray it on and, 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 and the sun kind of pops up. And it kind of travels across the sky and it sets and, and it, it does not pay you attention. This perfume <laughs> is very much Helios on the outside and Heliotrope on the inside. So you become the Heliotrope. At least that's my story. That's my mythology of this perfume. I feel very much like Clytie when I spray this perfume. I, I want this perfume to love me. I want this perfume to to tell me all it has to say, but this perfume behaves a little bit like Chanel number no. 19. It, it is arrogant. It, uh, it turns its head away from me. Um, Comet is very arrogant. Uh, it is a uh, very proud perfume. It, it has its own sense of dignity and uh, it does not look at Clyde. Um, it does what it does. You have to follow it. You have to find a way to jump on that comment and fly with it to all the places it takes you to. And um, it's a very emotional ride uh, because um, it's hard to jump on it, you know. 
It's very, very proud and dignified, very complex, very, very deep fragrance. And on the surface, it appears to be this sunny, breezy vibe, you know, maybe even superficial because of the cherry blossom. Some people say, oh, cherry blossom, such a cheap accord, you know. But no, none of that. Uh, there's sorrow and pain in here. There's a lot of darkness in here. And it only starts to make sense. And it's quite medicinal. It's very clinical. Uh, it's very Chanel. People who have just tested this a couple of times, you don't get it until you really... First of all, also the bottle, you know, when there was like no oxygen in here, uh, it had a different smell. And now it's like marinating slowly. It got a little bit of oxygen in there. Like it's getting... It's revealing itself fully. It takes time, so much time, because this thing is really so complex. And all the people saying it smells like Guerlain, you know, like uh, Apre Londe or um, the other one, what was it, Insolence, none of that. None of that. Once you really get to use this one more and more and more, it's its own thing. It's not uh, Guerlain. This is Chanel, but it's the future of Chanel. It took us to another planet, another reality, another space, another plot, another spot, and it's it's very futuristic Chanel, although it bears the DNA of Chanel number no. five. And this is the ticket to ride that you need to add to Comet in order to get that final piece of the puzzle and to get Helios to finally turn around and look at you. It's almost like an incomplete puzzle. Uh, the, this, this, this fragrance, is, it, it doesn't give you the last piece of the puzzle until we take Chanel number no. five. The extrait. And you layer it with Comet and like that, all the puzzle pieces fall into place. Like we were in this galaxy where all of these different fractals were just like everywhere. Everywhere, shooting stars, comets. And then you, you, you spray Chanel number no. five and it all like comes together. Oh. It, it makes sense. All of a sudden, Clytie is back, you know. Uh, she doesn't need to be the heliotrope anymore. She can go back to being her nymph self. It's like the curse has been broken. The spell is, is, has been broken. She, she wakes up again and she, she rises from that mountain and is finally free to dive back into the ocean and into the waters and see her family again and all her nymph sisters and her father. She's free from those chains. She, she has understood her independence, the strength that she actually has, the love for herself. Chanel number no. five is all about self-love. It's the key to every Chanel perfume experience. Chanel number no. five, the extrait, teaches me every time I sniff it how to love myself. It's not easy to love yourself. Most of the time in my life, I have been Clyde. I have been that person who has always tried to be loved by others, to be accepted by others, to, to be embraced by others, to, to, just to be heard by others. Chanel number no. five always teaches you, actually, you gotta love yourself. These two fragrances together are freedom. You just fly through the sky with these two, you know? It's so beautiful. You don't need the chariot with the fire spitting horses in order to fly in the sky with Helios. You fly on your own. You fly on your own and you don't need to physically fly. All you ever needed and all you will ever need in this lifetime, in this reality, is your imagination and your emotions. And if you let your emotions guide you, and if you listen to your gut instinct and your feelings without hurting others in the process, you will always be free. 
you will always be content. You will always be happy. You will always know exactly where you are, who you are. It's such a beautiful thing to have perfumes remind you of that. To have perfumes just tell you, you're okay. You're going to be okay. And that's ultimately where this little comet takes us to. It takes us to a special little place. You were thinking, boy, it's going to make us travel everywhere. The one place you thought it would never take you to is actually where it took me to. It flew inside of me. I'm the final destination. It showed me who I am. Independence and freedom. Very future Chanel, but also very, very simply put, classic Chanel DNA. That's what Chanel number no. five was always all about. Them two together, bam, magic. And it's not a perfume that is going to change your life because you already have your life. This perfume is not groundbreaking. Don't misunderstand my words. Tale as old as time. Nothing new here, but just a beautifully, elegantly concocted reminder that you on your own is all you need. You got it in you. You don't need to be the heliotrope at the tip of the mountain following Helios every day without ever being acknowledged. No need. That's all this perfume is. It's just a very, very, very simple reminder. But it's very elegant. And that means it's very silent. It whispers. If you don't know how to listen, you're not going to hear the story. And you're going to say, oh, it reminds me of Guerlain, it reminds me of this, it reminds me of that, it's just a boring, it's a, uh, you know. You might just find yourself sitting down and reviewing this fragrance by just reading something that some brand marketing printed out instead of actually trying to feel for a change what a perfume actually has to tell you. I think it's time to start feeling. And I don't think there could have been a better perfume to review on Mother's Day than this one. So to all the Clytes in the world, you're not alone because you are enough. Being with yourself, you're already a whole universe. You're already everything. You're all the stories you're ever going to need to know. You're all the stories you're ever going to need to tell. You're all the love you're ever going to need to feel. You're all the love you're ever going to need to give. That's a journey worth riding on, on this comet. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you like this review. And I hope you enjoy Comet. Until next time, thumb up the video. And never forget to never give up on love. Love you loads. Take care. Bye. So here you go. Now you know. <laughs> that was Comet. Um, and, you know, curious how How simple this perfume is, and uh, but uh, it it really it it takes you there. It really does. Um, silently, delicately, slowly, slowly, very slowly, and uh, mm. and you can't remember it. That's the weird thing. You you can't remember it. It it, it doesn't allow you to memorize it. It uh. Every day you spray it on new, it's new. It, it, there's no memory of it. It's like uh, your memory is washed out and then, you know, 
you're so in love with it's like Clyde herself she would forget every day you know the pain of yesterday because the hope that she has for getting him to look at her is so strong that she forgets the pain of yesterday she doesn't want to feel that pain yesterday and and that forgetting that and feeling something new again the next day is what this perfume is about it it's not there's no memory of it 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 it, it shifts ever so slightly every day you spray it on it's not an easy perfume not an easy perfume at all not easy to love not easy to wear but it's beautiful because it's just so vague in such an elegant way. And Tifa says, poor Clyde, she was all wrapped up in a big asshole. <laughs> Thank you, Debbie. Bravo. Such a thoughtful, loving review, says Finley. Tifa says, wow. Makes me appreciate it even more. Thank you, Aish. Uh, Tifa says, Hobbs is across the table from me and wanted to listen to what has drawn my attention off of him. Ha! He's your Helios, huh? Uh, beautiful review. Ah, thank you, Terry. Thank you. Yana Klaus says, thank you for the beautiful poetic review. Thank you. Thank you, Yana. Tipa says, poor Clyde. Yeah. Miss B says, oh, yay. Made it to the part of the stream. Hey, sweetie. <laughs> Mahor says, should have been called Mystère de Chanel. I mean, they could have, they should have called it Clyde. Mm -hmm. You know? But, but I, I kind of, I know they called it Comet for all the wrong reasons because of their, pro whatever, you know, brand marketing. But it kind of turns out to to work because, like I said, Clyde, uh, Comet is the Helios, but what's inside is Clyde. So Clyde is inside of Helios. So it's it's a very um, interesting duality uh, that, that this perfume uh, shows. It shows you the arrogance of Helios, but also the love of Clyde. It's, it's both. Both in one. Now, do we give Olivier Polge the benefit of the doubt that he has that much poetry in him? I don't think he does. Okay. I think he's very much Helios. I, I think he believes he's that sun god. I, I believe he's like, you know, he's this sexy, you know, uh, dude, older dude now, right? Like, you know. French dude, you know. Uh, and I don't think that he has it in him, really, to go that deep. But the, I think the poetry is all Jacob. Ah, oh, thanks, Debs. But yeah, there you have it. <clears throat> that was that missing link that I was trying to figure out now for one and a, one and a half months since I got the perfume. And, I, and it finally dawned on me, uh, I have to really, really go into Greek mythology to, to figure out what it is about this perfume that really uh, made sense to me. And that, that was it. It was, it was Clyde. It was there all along, the heliotrope. I mean... Why Why would Olivier choose the heliotrope? There's a reason, you know? I mean, even if he just thought, oh, well, that's a popular flower at the moment, it's trending at the moment, whatever, for whatever reason, subconsciously, I do believe that we are moved to make certain decisions and choices because of, like, the bigger picture that's out there. Consciously or subconsciously, something led him to do this. Something led him to, to choose these ingredients. Something made him, you know, it's like a constellation of things. Everything is holistic. The fact that brand market, you know, maybe because they wanted to call it uh, La Lune, the moon, it was like the cosmos, the universe was saying, no, you're going to make a comet. You know, and it made them change their mind. And and so they thought that they have control over the idea. You know, brand marketing probably thought, oh, we're going to, we have control over this. We think it's better to call it commit. Like they think that they actually had the freedom to decide 
but they didn't. Some some other entity decided for them, I believe, you know. It's kind of like a cosmical thing. And the fact that then he used heliotrope within this context probably didn't know what he was doing. But I'm connecting the dots here, and for me it makes sense. For me the heliotrope makes perfect sense for Comet. Perfect sense within this story. And, and also how this thing smells. Kev says, I'm very curious to see how Comet stands against other Liz exclusives over time. Um, it This one will age wonderfully. Give this one 10 years if they still make it in 10 years. Uh, this is going to be one of the best Liz exclusives fragrances because it's just... Um, People had very high expectations for this one, waiting for it for four years. So people were expecting God knows what, and it's not what they were expecting. Now they can tone down their expectations and they can, with time, reevaluate it, look at it again after some time has passed and realize, oh, okay, this thing is such an oddball within this entire collection of perfumes this thing, it's its its own thing, but it's very much rooted in Chanel DNA, regardless of it being its own thing. And it, it's going to be that special one that stands out from the collection that you're always going to go to when you want that subtle, sophisticated reminder of something. You're going to go, you're going to go for Comet. Uh, 